It's great to see so many people here in the, in the room, not that I was ever doubting that the room would get full. Um, my name is uh, Juha Uitto. Uh, I'm from the Evaluation Office of the uh, United Nations Development Program here in New York. And I have the uh, great pleasure of introducing a man who doesn't need much introduction in this, uh, this crowd, I am quite certain. Nevertheless, let me say a few words uh, uh, to welcome uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs um, to this uh, plenary session and uh, lecture. As we know, um, Professor Sachs is one of the leading international economic advisors to many, many groups and many uh, institutions uh, for over the past uh, couple of decades at least. Um, in the UN, where I uh, come from, and, and for all of us who are working on international development uh, issues, um, he's a very uh, well-known and central figure. Um, and um, his affiliation with the UN has been a, um, a long one already uh, now, starting, I don't know whether even starting with, but, but including that he was the um, director of the uh, United Nations Millennium Project from 2002 to 2006 and has been advising uh, previous and current uh, uh, secretary um, generals of the UN. So currently he's also a special, advisory, uh, speci special advisor to the secretary general Ban Ki-moon um, on, on the Millennium Development Goals. Um, his day job I, I would uh, guess is the is as the director of the Earth Institute at the uh, Columbia University here in New York, and um, as an economist, he has uh, been um, one of those who has um, had the ability and wisdom to think very broadly about the issues relating to uh, economic development, sustainable development, climate change, and so forth. And he's been a long-term, uh, long-time analyst of the two-way relationship between physical geography and economic development. And um, this is um, something that has um, earned him uh, to be an honorary geographer appointed by the Association of American Geographers already in, in 2007, uh, which is... Uh, five years ago. So, um, without further ado, I, I think I will ask, uh, ask Professor Jeffrey Sachs to start this uh, uh, speech. Um, just a couple of words of how we've organized this. Um, uh, we only have one microphone here on stage, so I say these organizational things now before he starts uh, speaking. I think um, uh, he plans to speak for about uh, half an hour, maybe. We have time uh, until approximately uh, 12.50, with a little bit of flexibility. I shouldn't say that now, but uh, I understand that. Um, we have uh, one microphone here for the audience. We will uh, leave the um, rest of the time in this session for audience participation and comments and questions from, from the floor. So. Uh, uh, when the time comes, so uh, please use this microphone, which is here at the front, and when you make your comments, so please uh, introduce yourself. Now, um, the room is getting quite full. There are some uh, chairs here in, in, uh, in the middle still, but also please note that you can use these uh, 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 side spaces here. Please don't stay on the corridors, but, but here on the in the, um, uh, at the sides you have these um, alcoves that uh, you can stay in. Okay, so um, without further ado, I, you didn't come here to listen to me, so I will ask uh, Jeffrey Sachs to uh, uh, make his remarks. Thank you, Juha, and uh, th thank you, uh, to the uh, AAG for inviting me back and also for that great honor of being named an honorary geographer, which is 
uh, a tremendous pleasure for me uh, because not only do I admire uh, the profession of geography enormously, but I believe that it is absolutely crucial for solving the growing problems that we face on the planet and the problems that I want to talk about today. I'd like to speak on the subject of geography and sustainable development, uh, and especially on what I hope will be uh, a growing role of geographers and of the science of geography in helping to chart a sustainable development path for the planet. This is a, a, an unsolved mystery for all of us. There are no parts of the world where we could say that sustainable development is assured. There are very few countries uh, or even regions uh, within countries that are truly sustainable right now, especially since all parts of the world are increasingly subject to massive global change and global disturbances uh, outside the control of any region. And the problems are mounting, even though the solutions are also getting better and better. So we have a very important and fascinating challenge for humanity, which is uh, that uh, we've set ourselves up for a huge test of whether we can get organized to accept yes as an answer of uh, adopting practical and available solutions to our problems or whether we'll continue in a current course which absolutely will take us into uncharted and extraordinarily dangerous uh, and uh, in many ways killer uh, territory. I think that the period for geography uh, to play a central role in this is not only obvious, which is why this meeting is <coughs> setting records for attendance, uh, but is obvious in terms of the kinds of data and evidence that are being used daily in decision making. Um, we're all looking at GIS, we're all looking at the kinds of information and analyses and uh, spatial uh, information in particular that were really not in the policy makers uh, attention until uh, recently uh, and I think there's been a wonderful change. I, I always felt <clears throat> as an economist that uh, economists felt that countries were located in the world basically in alphabetical order uh, because that's how we always found them. Uh, we looked at tables of numbers <clears throat> We rarely looked at maps. Uh, now everybody has to look at maps uh, and has to look at the kind of information that uh, geographic information systems and the geographers are putting forward. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so what I really want to talk about today is a, what I hope will be a new and fruitful marriage of geography with economics, public health, and of course, earth system science, which uh, is uh, intrinsically part of, uh, of geography. But I'm looking and want to discuss my thoughts about ways to make these disciplines more effectively interactive. And of course, that's the work that we try to do day in and day out at the Earth Institute. I think it's important to start out by saying that economics once did have it better. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of my own profession, but only on the classical side of it. It's always worth reading Adam Smith, by the way, uh, though uh, The Wealth of Nations was written in 1776 and uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments uh, in uh, 1759. He had a lot of wisdom on a lot of points, and it's also uh, good for the soul to get back in touch with the Scottish Enlightenment, which was one of the glorious uh, uh, eras of human thought. But Smith in The Wealth of Nations uh, was strikingly geographic uh, in his understanding. And so the profession started out on the right course, but somewhat uh, quickly and really by the middle of the 19th century, uh, had uh, lost touch with a lot of the 
geographic roots of economics. Smith, of course, had a basic idea that economic productivity comes from the division of labor, and the division of labor is made possible by the scope of the market. And so on the policy side, we remember Smith as saying, leave markets open to trade so that the scope of the market can be as large as possible and indeed global. But Smith was also very clear that the scope of the market was a geographical phenomenon as well as a policy phenomenon. And if you look at the opening chapters of The Wealth of Nations, you'll be, as geographers, you'll be pleased to see things like the following. I thought I would just read uh, a couple of excerpts briefly. Smith pointed out that since such, therefore, are the advantages of water carriage, that is water-based trade, it is natural that the first improvements of art and industry should be made where this conveniency opens the whole world for a market to the produce of every sort of labor, and that they should always be much later extended, much later in extending themselves into the inland parts of the country. The inland parts of the country can for a long time have no other market for the greater part of their goods but the country which lies around them and separates them from the seacoast and the great navigable rivers. And he concluded, uh, even without uh, good computer data, uh, that uh, all the inland parts of Africa and all that part of Asia which lies any considerable way north of the Euxine and Caspian Seas, the ancient Scythia, the modern Tartaria and Siberia seem in all ages of the world to have been in the same barbarous and uncivilized state in which we find them at present. And he goes on to say why. The Sea of Tartari is the frozen ocean which admits of no navigation. And though some of the greatest rivers in the world run through that country, they are at too great a distance from one another to carry commerce and communication. There are in Africa none of those great inlets, such as the Baltic and Adriatic in Europe, the Mediterranean, and Euxine or Black Seas in both Europe and Asia and the Gulfs of Arabia, Persia, India, Bengal, and Siam in Asia to carry maritime commerce into the interior parts of that great continent. And the great rivers of Africa are at too great a distance from one another to give occasion to any considerable inland navigation. So there you were right at the start. But by the middle of the 19th century, unfortunately, uh, with the focus on industry as opposed to agriculture, among uh, other reasons, the geographic focus uh, fell away. And I think it's a hard battle to bring it back because space, uh, and especially physical geography, still plays almost no role in the vast majority of economic studies uh, and uh, quantitative economic analysis. I think what we know today also does extend far beyond Smith in terms of the fruitfulness of putting a physical geography base to economics because Smith was focused on, uh, in particular, on transport conditions and therefore he gave great emphasis to the seacoast and to navigable waterways as being the pathways of development. But now, because of the advances of knowledge, we can understand in a far deeper and more subtle way the many pathways of physical geography to economic development. And I just want to mention them at the outset. Uh, certainly, physical geography shapes the crucial founding sector of almost all economies, and that is the agriculture sector. Uh, without uh, the capacity of climate, soils, uh, and uh, uh, other and topography uh, to produce a viable food supply, uh, it's only under very rare conditions that uh, countries have been able to get started. And there is very clear uh, linkage uh, of uh, physical geography, agroecological systems, uh, productivity of agriculture, and pathways of development. We also understand in a way that Smith literally could not have understood how disease ecology uh, is uh, affected by fundamental geographical variables uh, and how disease ecology is a fundamental shaper of economic dynamics. And in my own research over the last 15 years, I've studied one particular disease uh, in most intensity, and that's malaria. 
Malaria is an absolutely fascinating disease if you are fascinated by diseases. Um, and uh, it's a major killer, a major shaper of poverty and development. And as my teacher of, about malaria, a late great entomologist uh, at Harvard, uh, Andrew Spielman, used to say it's a disease of place. So it is a geographer's disease. Uh, it's not the malaria, as the uh, Italians thought, the bad air, of course. It's a mosquito-transmitted disease, this, and that pathway was only known 100 years ago. But what's fascinating about it is that, therefore, the force of transmission depends both on climate, especially temperature, which determines the speed of the life cycle of the pathogen inside the mosquito host, the sporogeny cycle, and breeding sites. Uh, you need enough water so that the larvae can breed. And the ecology of the anopheline uh, species, because there are different types of anopheles. It happens, to make a long story short, that Africa just has it worst in all regards, inherently by dint of physical geography and ecology, the kind of mosquito that Africa has, the Anopheles gambi, loves to bite humans. That's how it evolved, rather than to bite cattle. That affects the force of transmission to a squared power, that uh, tendency to bite humans. And the very high temperatures also tremendously increase the African force of infection. So you have a malarious environment and malaria for a lot of pathways of human development and demography have shaped poverty and prevented uh, an escape from the poverty trap in the high endemic regions of the world until very, very recently. Another obvious uh, link of physical geography and economic development and one that's becoming more important is, is hazards. I was going to say natural hazards, but now they're also uh, anthropogenically being driven not only by places people choose to live, but also by the anthropogenic drivers of uh, extreme events, storms, uh, rising sea levels, uh, uh, higher intensity hurricanes, and of course climate change uh, more generally. And we know that certain parts of the world uh, are uh, burdened inherently by higher hazard risks. Uh, Haiti, which has been a focus of AAG this year, has everything, every risk factor one can imagine. Not only its own poverty, but of course uh, being in a, the major uh, Caribbean hurricane zone and being uh, on uh, tectonic plates that led to one of the worst earthquakes in human history, one of the most lethal uh, in uh, human history. The Philippines the same way. What we're finding in our studies and uh, some unpublished work at the Earth Institute uh, seems to be pointing to uh, much longer duration effects of disasters than one might think from, uh, uh, from uh, casual uh, reflection. And that is that after extreme hurricanes in some of the high impact areas, the recovery rates of human health and economy are very long uh, duration. Uh, and this means that a repeated cycle of natural disasters can have a devastating effect on the state of an economy over a long period of time. I would add as a fifth, uh, or I guess, yes, a fifth element, uh, transport, food production, disease, natural hazards, I would add geopolitics as well. Where you are in the world uh, depends on how easily you're invaded how many people are uh, sniffing around your land. Being in the Middle East really is being in the middle uh, of a lot of powers, and it means really being overrun uh, by uh, armies uh, coming from multiple directions. Being uh, island economies like Japan and, and uh, Great Britain uh, have made uh, a positive difference uh, in uh, the era of modern economic growth. I think the last point that I would make of what Smith couldn't know and what we know now is that the causation uh, of physical geography and human uh, activity is fully bicausal uh, and uh, aggressively so on our crowded planet. So not only does physical geography shape 
economic life, but economic life increasingly, of course, is coming to dominate uh, physical processes. And it is understanding that two-way interaction which lies at the heart of our well-being and uh, quite possibly our survival in this century. I think that there are three basic facts of our age that I would keep in mind as guideposts for thinking about this new marriage of geography, economics, public health, and earth system science. The first, it is also a geographic as well as an economic reality, is globalization. This, of course, is nothing new in a way. One of the glorious lines of the wealth of nations is when Adam Smith says the two most momentous events in the history of mankind were the discovery of the sea routes to the Americas uh, and the sea routes from Europe to Asia. So globalization is a phenomenon that really took hold in the modern way starting around 1498 with Vasco da Gama's uh, voyage uh, from Europe to Asia and back. But something clearly different qualitatively and quantitatively is occurring right now. By dint of politics and even more by dint of technology, the extent of the interconnections of today's economies with the distant parts of the world are far greater than it ever before in human history. Uh, Smith made famous the idea of a global division of labor, but the intensity of the division of production chains within companies, for example, is a phenomenon really of the last 50 years, made possible by containerization, by uh, computer-assisted design and manufacturing, now by the internet and uh, all that it makes possible in uh, logistic uh, capabilities that were undreamable uh, before. Now, globalization not only has knit the world together in production, finance, trade, and technology, it also makes the world in some ways more equal because it allows for rapid catching up of laggard uh, regions, economically laggard regions, that is. The rate of economic growth of China, 10% per year over the last 32 years, is a world record and it's a record of globalization. So it could never have happened had China not gone a direction of export-led growth. It also makes the world less even in many, many ways as well. Because, for example, as Adam Smith rightly predicted and is still true today, the big growth has come on the coasts around the world. And there's massive migration from the interior to the coasts. And the mountain societies uh, have uh, suffered the most, perhaps, in many ways, because human capital has left, uh, and uh, what's left behind are often very impoverished and unstable uh, societies, though with very rich local cultures. So the earth decidedly is not flat, uh, which Thomas Friedman should have known had he consulted AAG. Um, and it's, it's not flat uh, either topographically or uh, economically. Now, the second huge change, of course, in today's world, a unique phenomenon for us, is that we are in the age of the Anthropocene. We've entered it. Geologists uh, are adopting this term not merely as a metaphor, but as a literal geologic epoch. Uh, it seems to fit the bill so far as uh, the geologic societies have asked the question, have we left the Holocene uh, and entered a new epoch? Uh, and uh, if so, can it be rightly termed an Anthropocene? And I think the evidence is increasingly yes. Uh, core features of, uh, Earth's, uh, of uh, Earth functions, uh, including sedimentation rates, uh, including of course, uh, carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling, hydrologic cycle, uh, and climate are increasingly under human control from a technical point of view, but la loss of control from another point of view. I mean, under control of human drivers, but not under control of human intention intentionality. But I think the Anthropocene is the existential reality of our time, made all the more poignant 
by the fact that it is completely and utterly denied by one of the two major political parties of the United States. Uh, and uh, that and all of the corporate propaganda and vested interests in this country have left us totally bereft uh, of uh, action and policies and even public understanding of what we're coming into. And we may enjoy our 60 degree Fahrenheit February days right now, but we should understand that we're passing through a phase. And while we may enjoy our 60 degree winter days uh, in New York City, the uh, Somalis have not enjoyed their drought uh, this year, nor have the Burkinabes enjoyed the deepening drought in the Sahel and the global facts of the Anthropocene are becoming more and more dramatic. We do see every day the capacity of rich people to ignore the plight of poor people. That seems to be a condition that is a deep part of our condition uh, as uh, human beings. But it doesn't change the reality that the Anthropocene is dangerous, profound, encompassing, uh, and already upon us. This is not about our children and our children's children alone. It's about us, and it's happening right now, and we're already in it, and it uh, is uh, intensifying. The third aspect that I would highlight is the accompanying technological revolutions. We are in the greatest age of technological advance in human history, which makes it quite paradoxical uh, and quite difficult to respond to our realities today. Because depending on how you get up out of the bed in the morning, you can be super pessimistic or you can be almost uh, panglossianly optimistic. Uh, you can say, yeah, we've got some teething pains, but think of the miracles uh, that we can accomplish every day. And that's a true story. Uh, and then, on the other hand, uh, after you hit yourself a little bit, you remember our capacity to ignore the benefits that we can accrue from our knowledge and the dangers of the path that we're on. So the world's paradoxical precisely because we're not inevitably going over the edge, we're not inevitably passing the planetary boundaries, we're not inevitably uh, entering the era of uh, catastrophic abrupt change, but we could. And the reason that we might not is largely technological, in my view, uh, which may also be a paradox, because it's technology, of course, that has brought us to where we are. But it's only going to be technology that will bring us out. That may be the Faustian uh, trap or the Faustian bargain of humanity. There is no low technology solution for humanity's problems, except if you can tell me a way to uh, happily peacefully and rapidly reduce from 7 billion people whose lives depend on technology down to uh, something that a low technology earth would support, and I think one that would not be very desirable. What are these revolutions? They're coming in at least three huge areas. The first is information technology, basically digitization everywhere all the time. I resist checking my BlackBerry as I talk to you, but it's hard because it's an addiction. Um, we have uh, all the time, real time data. So far, it's driving us crazy, but I believe soon it will be mostly machine to machine. It may drive machines crazy, but it's going to take some of the pressure off of us because uh, we're just not as good at reading all of this as our mach smarter machines uh, will be. Um, and I guess there's already machine-to-machine -machine dating uh, services and so forth, so one can take out the human element uh, in some of this and uh, ease the tension on our time. Second is the biological revolution, genomics, uh, proteomics, and, and uh, understanding the mechanistic uh, pathways of molecular biology uh, and uh, biological systems. Uh, third, I would add uh, nanotechnology and the ability to make things uh, and make better things in ways that are absolutely uh, unimaginable uh, until very, very recently. Now, 
information and communications technology shapes economies like nothing else. And uh, the ICT revolution is already perhaps the most dramatic reshaper of the world economy. It changes the meaning of space. Uh, it uh, changes uh, the nature of flows of information and ideas. Banking, for example, has now come to rural Africa within the last two years, not even by uh, ATM machines, much less branches, which will never be there, but of course on cell phones. Uh, and uh, mass cell phone based banking is going to bring almost everybody into a formal financial sector very, very quickly. Uh, business operations are changing decisively. I think our own profession, at least my own profession of teaching, is about to be radically disrupted, uh, probably more than has been true for the last 2,000 years. Because what's the use of me as a talking head uh, in front of uh, 30 students when it can all be streamed and provided to millions if they want to look uh, at zero marginal cost? Uh, so I think that information technology will dramatically change the space and uh, possibilities of uh, of, of uh, the world economy. Of course, ICT has completely reshaped geography as well. It's uh, probably the most important reason for the fundamental surge of the field, in addition to the reality of the Anthropocene. And that is what geographers can do now is magical. Uh, and it was really not possible before a lot of the GIS revolution, remote sensing, uh, satellite-based, uh, GPS-based systems. Uh, but now everything is possible. And I find that uh, information technology is completely reshaping how we also do development practice just in the last uh, two or three years. Uh, we're using it for everything that we do in fighting poverty. Uh, and it becomes absolutely the core enabler, whether it's for the health system or for an emerging uh, local education system in a village or for the deployment of more sophisticated local infrastructure because now we're using, uh, for instance, solar power uh, in uh, off-grid systems but the solar power is provided to households on a prepay basis, like they prepay for phones, and everything is metered. And uh, our colleagues, uh, the engineers who have set up this system for villages in Mali, for example, can watch who's got the lights on uh, in uh, this village outside of Segu in real time on the internet, and they can see whether the system's working, not working, whether the people who are supposed to be maintaining the panels and so forth are doing their job. And the same is true for all manner of infrastructure, for water supplies and uh, transport and, uh, and so forth. We also have found that with smartphones, what used to take years to do a geographic mapping of uh, systems now is a matter of weeks. Train uh, groups of young students with smartphones to go out and point and click at water points, at schools, at clinics, at hospitals, ask some uh, uh, online uh, touchscreen questions uh, to put data into the cloud. And within a few weeks, you can map a country of 150 million people, actually. Uh, so what's possible now in terms of really mobilizing spatially accurate information is completely phenomenal. And uh, this, I think, is uh, another huge breakthrough. So we see ourselves uh, at the Earth Institute and increasingly in partnerships around the world with really forging a new field, which I do like to call a, the field of sustainable development. Many new fields are born over time, uh, biochemistry from biology and chemistry, and I think sustainable development is a field that is being forged not so much of a natural merger of knowledge, but really out of the most pressing questions that humanity faces and therefore requires us to reorganize our intellectual efforts in different ways. So if we are in the age of the Anthropocene with this two-way feedback between natural and uh, human systems, 
then we have to get organized to understand it far more rigorously uh, and rapidly than we do. And the challenge of sustainable development is precisely this, in my opinion. We are 7 billion people and a $70 trillion world economy right now. The population is continuing to rise with another billion expected by 2024 and another billion after that expected by 2044. At the same time, the world economy is continuing to expand, not so much in the North Atlantic of the rich world, the US and Europe, but in the emerging economies that are catching up by virtue of globalization. And the aggregate global growth rate is about four to four and a half percent per year right now. That means a doubling time of less than 20 years. Now, we're already objectively unsustainable at the levels of resource use of today. So our carbon emissions, uh, our uh, uh, use of uh, groundwater, our destruction of habitats, our pollution of uh, major cities are already unsustainable. And yet what we're packing in is a significant multiplier of current economic activity. And there isn't a country in the world, certainly not in the developing world, that has stood up and said, we've had enough, we'll just stay where we are. I'd say the deepest DNA of the world political system is to speed economic growth. And that's especially true of poorer countries and completely understandable. Now, it's objectively impossible for this to succeed on the current technological pathway. And that's why we need a field of sustainable development. And the questions are at least the following, in my opinion. First, how will global change affect local regions? What does climate change mean? It's not if, it's happening. Uh, it will continue to happen because of thermal inertia, because of uh, uh, masking of uh, global warming, uh, because of particulates and so forth. We're only seeing a small portion of the climate change that we've already induced, much less what's going to come through continued emissions. How will this affect regions. This requires very deep earth system and economic science understanding. And it requires a rigorously spatial and temporal kind of analysis that doesn't exist right now. Second, how do local actions accumulate to global change? Because we're now in the period where the forcings are at global scale for depletion, for pollution, for population, and we don't know how to aggregate from the ground up. Third, and crucial, we're pretty miserable at thinking about population movements and migration. We don't have systemic global regimes for this. We don't have rules of the game that are stable. Uh, we don't have a good vision of what's going to come. And in most places in the world, people don't like migrants. Uh, and so this is setting up massive, massive threats and risks for us. And it requires, again, spatial demographic analysis. And fourth, and I think this is absolutely critical, and it adds a vital dimension that we're also not so good at ana analytically, how can new technological pathways actually enable a combination of economic development and environmental sustainability. And here, I do think that there are answers. There are ways to mobilize far less impactful and deleterious technologies. We know that, in principle, solar and wind energy, though at a higher cost, could power the entire planet. We know that getting from here to there requires very uh, difficult economic and policy choices. We know that it requires a tremendous amount of R&D, new political uh, frameworks, regional cooperation, and so forth. And we don't have uh, almost any of that started at this point. 
But I do believe, some people fault me for it, but I do believe that technological change is the most fundamental of the approaches that we'll need, maybe not as fundamental as an ethical recognition of our responsibility to figure out answers. Maybe that really is the prior answer. But if we can show that there are technological pathways forward, we're also going to reduce the aggression and fear factors, uh, perhaps, to allow us to explore uh, better the ethical responsibilities as well. Now, finally, I want to say that all of this seems to me to open up a new chapter of analytical modeling. And a lot of this is happening, so I'm not meaning to invent anything new, but I'm seeing it from the point of view of my own profession, which is economics, which uh, you could say for worse, but I think somewhat inevitably has a major seat at the table in decision making and should when it's done right, because economics is about resource choices uh, and is about uh, a broader understanding of the true alternatives that a society or a world has in how it deploys resources for human well-being. So that's a pretty important uh, subject. It's not so good when it is bereft of the underpinnings of geography physical, uh, physical uh, earth system science and so forth, especially in a time like this. There are almost no, that's eh, not quite true, you know, regional economists do spatial models, but there are very few economic development or economic growth models that incorporate spatial and physical geography dimensions in an adequate way. There are still fewer that are spatial, intertemporal, and with a two-way feedback between human interactions as drivers of change and anthropogenic effects feeding back into economic systems. There are fewer still that add in demography, because demography is a fundamental driver, of course where people live, how they live, how they interact, how they move, will determine a lot about war and peace in the coming decades. A lot of the wars in Africa are about movements of population from desperate places and the lack of welcome when they arrive at the new places. And none of these models that I know of is truly integrated with the final point, and that is technological change. For economists, technological change is the movement of a parameter lambda. For the rest of the world, it's actually a set of choices about different energy systems, water use, ways to grow food that are far more than a parameter. And a sophisticated integration of these factors, the underpinnings of physical geography and earth systems, economies that rest in a meaningful way on their physical substrate and in which the physical substrate affects food productivity, public health, access to markets, costs of transport, uh, location of cities and populations, and where populations change by natural increase and in migration, and where technologies are fundamental drivers of future possibilities. That's a very tall order. But that, I think, is at least my image and recommendation of the ways that we need to move. How can we train and pool our resources in this way? One of the things that we've done at the Earth Institute is to create a PhD in sustainable development that has as its prerequisite, as its core, that every student has both natural scientists and social scientists as advisors, and that the dissertation is at that cutting edge. We've had some beautiful work in the last three or four years drawing very heavily on geographic information systems, drawing very heavily on the tools of geography, and integrating them with agronomy, 
with natural hazards, with the uh, health, and with economic development. It seems a promising route. It's one I know that the AAG can help to lead in the future. Thank you very much.